Hello, in this video, we're going to record um, the unit two review solutions. Um, but give me one second, I do need to get my visualizer working. So, Okay, so there's the review, the manual focus, just so that it doesn't keep um, adjusting every time I stick my hand in front. And let me adjust this. There we go. And adjust this. Okay, so with that, we should be able to start now. So for number one in the review, it says G of x, y equals the integral from y, x to y of 2t minus 7 dt. Okay, and so for part A, well, for A, B, C, and D, they're just asking us to plug in numbers for y and x. So for me, I think it would be better to find the solution of this in terms of x and y first. And then that way, all you have to do is plug in the x and y values that are given, okay? So the integral of 2t with respect to dt is t squared. And then the integral of negative seven with respect to dt is negative seven t. And then I do still need to plug in my bounds, x and y. So then we get, um, y squared minus seven y subtract x squared minus 7x. And so what that tells us is that g of xy looks like y squared minus x squared minus 7y and plus 7x. Okay, and so now that I have this expression, I can go ahead and start giving the solutions for parts A, B, and C, and D. So here I get zero squared minus two squared minus seven times zero plus seven times two. Um, and ultimately, what do I end up with? I end up with um, negative four plus 14, which is 10. And so in this box, I will type 10. Then for part B, we're doing the point two comma one. So it would be one squared minus two squared minus seven times one plus seven times two, which is one minus two minus seven plus 14. And that turns out to equal six. For part C, we have two and three halves. So we have um, three halves squared minus two squared minus seven times three halves plus seven times two. So we have nine over four minus four minus 21 over two plus 14. And we get one fourth as the output there. Well, it says enter a fraction or a decimal. I was just going to enter the exact decimal, 0 0.25. And then for the last one, we're going to plug in um, 3 halves comma 0. So y is 0, x is 3 halves. So 
So we end up with negative nine over four plus 21 over two. And we get 33 over four. But if I have to enter a decimal, it would be 8.25. Let's see. Oh, it did not like my middle numbers. Let's see what happened here. So we plugged in, that would be negative four, take away seven plus 14. Oh, this one should have been three. I did, oh, no, it won't be three. It'll be one minus four minus seven plus 14. What was I thinking? I don't know what I typed in the calculator to give me six, but the answer should have been four. Then now over here, we did this guy. When I square that, I get nine over four, and then take away four, and then take away 21 over two, and then I'm gonna add 14. Oh, I get seven over four which is 1.75. So let's change this one to 1.75. I must not have typed it in my calculator correctly. Oh, okay, see, now we got it all right. But the second time I typed it in my calculator, I did um, get correct. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to number two. And number two gives us this equation. And it wants us to describe the level curves for the constant equal to negative two, zero, three, and five, okay? So essentially what these C values are is they become the Z values. So this equation becomes negative two equal to x plus y, which can be written as y equals negative x minus two, just by minusing the x over. When c equals zero, we have this equation, which can be written as y equals negative x. When c equals three, we have this equation, which can look like negative x and a positive three. And then finally, for c equal to five, we can solve for y and get negative x plus five. Now notice that the slope on each of these functions is a negative one. Here the slope is negative one, here the slope is negative one, and here the slope is negative one. But the y coordinates are different. Here it's negative two, here it's like an invisible zero, here it's a three, and here it's a five, okay? So if they all have the same slope, but different y-intercepts, then what they are, are parallel. Parallel only has one R, sorry. I should know better. In high school, I got a 99 on my final exam because I spoke parallel wrong. And here I am, 22 years later, still spelling parallel wrong. These are going to be parallel lines. There we go. Okay, so then that means the only image here that really has parallel lines is going to be this image here. And I definitely wanna make sure I select up there where it says parallel lines. Okay, moving on to number three. So here they give us a different function, a different equation. Um, oh, and it tells me C can equal zero, one, two, three, and four. Okay, so in this problem, we're gonna do the same thing as before. We're gonna let Z equal all of those C values. 
And so then this is really, this can be written as zero equal to x squared over one plus, um, I'm sorry, x squared over three plus y squared over one. If I divide everybody by three, okay. Then now let's go ahead and plug in one. And if I divide everybody, I'm not gonna divide everybody by three because I wanna keep that a one. So I'm gonna keep that a one. This would be written as x squared over one. And this would be written as y squared over one third. Okay. Then let's plug in two. And so I am gonna divide everybody by two so I can get the one here. But remember, this is y squared over one third. And when I multiply it by, when I divide it by two, it actually multiplies by two in the denominator. So the denominator down there becomes two thirds. Similarly for three, if I divide everybody by three, I get one x squared over three plus just y squared over one. And then finally, if I plug in four, if I divide everybody by four, I'm going to get this expression. Okay. And so for this one, it really only can be satisfied when X and Y are both equal to um, zero. So this one is actually just a point on the origin, okay? Whereas these three are all um, elliptic. Ellipticals, okay? With one of the radii here and then the other radii there right, or the square root of those things, okay? So these are all um, elliptical, which I think the way they phrase it is non-circular ellipses. Okay, so I'm going to be selecting the option that says the non cylinder ellipses. And then for the graphs, I want to picture, I want the graphs with all the ellipticals, all the ellipses. So it's going to be this option in the bottom left. Okay. Yes, we got two checks there. Okay. Moving on to number four. Here we have f of x, y equal to this. And before I start plugging in the c's, I'm actually going to rewrite this a little differently. Okay, first thing is I'm going to write this as a z. And the second thing is, is I'm going to square both sides. So this is going to become z squared, and then the house is going to go away over here. So when I plug in 0 for z, I am going to move the x squared and the y squared over. So this becomes x squared plus y squared equal to 16. Then when I plug in 1, So I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna add the x squared and add the y squared over, but I'm also gonna subtract. So I get 15 over here on this side. 16 minus the one squared is 15. Now I'm gonna plug in the next c value. So again, I'm gonna add the x squared and the y squared over, but I'm also gonna subtract this four over. So I get 12.
So same thing, add the y, x squared and the y squared. And then 16 minus 9 is 7. Okay. So this is a circle with radius equal to 4. This is a circle with the radius equal to square root of 15. This is a circle with radius equal to the square root of 12. And this is a circle with the square root of 7 as the radius. All of them have the center of 0, 0, since there's nothing inside the squares with the x or the y. So they all have a center of 0, 0 which means all of them are circles, okay? Um, so then our level curves are circles, and then we have the smallest one with the radius of four and the smallest one with the radius of, um, what is this? Square root of seven is about 2.65. Okay, so the biggest radius is four, which is this one right here when c equals zero. And the smallest radius is about 2.65 and it's when c is equal to three. Okay, so it's going to be this top left. Okay, now we're moving on to, um, section 13.2 stuff. So they want me to take this limit. As long as it's not gonna make anything undefined, you can just use direct substitution. So the X will become one um, and one again, and the Y will become 98. So you get one over the square root of 99. And I think that can be simplified into one over the square root of three, or I'm sorry, one over three square root of 11. Okay, and then it's asking me about continuity. So the only thing I have to worry about about continuity is that the x plus y inside the radical must be greater than or equal to zero. But because it's in the denominator, it can't actually equal zero. So I will not put a bar on my inequality symbol, which means it's this option, x plus y greater than zero. Okay, number six. Number six is pretty much finding the partial derivatives, but using the limit process. Even though we know how to do partial derivatives the fast way, um, for these problems, you really do need to practice with your um, simplifying, okay? So what I'm going to be doing here is I'm gonna be doing the limit as delta x goes to zero. And then instead of plugging in f of x plus delta x, I'm gonna plug it in. So plugging in x plus delta x into my function. Then I'm going to subtract the original function. All over delta x. OK. Now this means I'm going to get, um, this is going to be 8x squared plus 16x times delta x plus 8 delta x squared. This is what I get if I FOIL this out and then distribute the 8. And then here, if I distribute the minus, and all of this is still over delta x, OK? And as you can see from what we have so far, um, x squared will cancel and five uh, y squared will cancel. So we will get the limit of 16x delta x plus eight delta x squared over delta x. Now I can simplify this
So if I split it and I take this fraction, let's just do it, and put it over delta x plus the other term, I get the limit as delta x goes to zero of 16x plus eight delta x. Then if I actually take the limit, um, the delta x will turn to zero. And so I just get 16x, okay? So I know you know how to do the partial derivatives, but if I take this part off the limit and I just tell you to find the difference quotient, right? Without the limit part, just the fraction part, okay? If I just ask you for that, you really do need to learn, know the mechanics of it because the answer would be this before I ever took the limit, okay? I need to make sure that you know how to do this simplification. So it just may be that on the test, you're asked for this before you actually plug in the zero, okay? And so if that happens, make sure that you're actually doing the definition because the answer won't be 16x. It'll be 16x plus eight times delta x, okay? Um, so you definitely have to make sure that you're doing the correct process so that you can get the correct numbers here. Now, similarly, I'm going to do the same for the other partial derivative. So now I'm plugging in, I'm doing f of x plus, or I'm sorry, I'm doing f of x comma y plus delta y. So in the original function, x is gonna stay x, but the y will become y plus delta y. And then I'm gonna subtract the original function. And of course it's all over delta y. So I'm going to foil this out and then distribute the five. I get five y squared plus 10 y delta y plus um, five delta y squared. And then over here, I get minus x squared and minus five y squared, all over delta y. And so similarly, the eight x squared cancel and the five y squared cancel. And so I just have 10 y delta y plus five delta y squared over delta y. And just like before, you can um, simplify that. So 10 y delta y over delta y plus five delta y squared over delta y. And when I simplify that, I get 10x plus five delta y. And then if I actually take the limit, I'm going to plug in a zero for delta y and that results in just 10x. So here for this question in the test, I can just type in, um, Oh, it's not 10x. The delta y is canceled. It should be 10y, right? There we go. Let's see. Okay. So again, if you see this problem on the test and it does not have the limit, you do need to actually find the difference quotient, okay? So make sure that you're aware of how to find it and the mechanics on simplifying that.
now number seven. So I like to write this differently. I like to write it like four y squared x to the one half. And I also like to write it four x to the one half y squared, okay? And the reason why is because when I'm taking the derivative with respect to x, um, all of this will act like a coefficient, okay? But when I take the derivative with respect to y, the x becomes the coefficient. And then this is a little bit more obvious that that's the coefficient, okay? So when I'm doing dz dx, I'm actually going to be taking the derivative of this version of z. All of these are equivalent. So it doesn't matter which form I use. I just like to visually use this form. And if I need to put it in a different form, um, my mind is already thinking this, okay? But here, that means I'm going to take 14y squared out because that's just a coefficient, right? And really, we're just taking the derivative of x to the 1 half. So it becomes 14y squared times 1 half x to the negative 1 half, if I use my power rule. So then that gives me 7y squared x to the negative 1 half. Or if I write it as a fraction, 7y squared over x to the 1 half. And if I put it back in a house like the way it was given to me, it would be 7y squared over the square root of x, OK? Again, all of this stuff can be done in your head, OK? So I don't always write all these steps out, but this is literally what's going on in my brain, OK? I just don't write it all out every single time takes a lot of time and it wastes a lot of paper when you can already see where it's going, okay? So same thing here. Now I'm doing the derivative with respect to y. So I wanted this version of the of z so that I can take out that coefficient. So basically I have this coefficient and I only need to find the derivative with respect to y of the y squared. And I get 2y. So then this is 28 x to the 1 half y, or they like to write it 28 y, and then the square root of x on the side. So let's go see here. We're going to have fraction for sure. And 7 y squared on the top, and then square root of x at the bottom. And here we're going to have 28y and then square root of x. Oops. Um, there we go. And let's check both of those. OK. So when I do number eight, you're going to notice that I don't do so much writing but I'm still doing all the separation in my mind, okay? So for here, so f of x without plugging in the zero, fx, the derivative, first partial derivative with respect to x is, um, this guy's going to act like the constant and the derivative of e to the negative 3x is e to the negative 3x. Chain rule, take the derivative of that exponent, I get negative 3. So if I clean this up, it's negative 3 e to the negative 3x cosine of y. And if I want to plug in 0, 0, this is going to be negative 3 e to the negative 3 times 0 cosine of 0. This is e to the 0. And then cosine of 0 is actually 1. And this is also 1. 
So I have negative three times one times one, which is just negative three. Now Fy, which is the partial derivative with respect to y. So now um, this is acting like the coefficient. And the derivative of cosine of y is negative sine y. So this becomes negative e to the negative 3x sine of y. And if I plug in the 0, 0, we get um, negative e to the negative 3 times 0 sine of 0. So we get negative e to the 0, and sine of 0 is actually 0. So we end up with negative one times zero, which is just zero. And let's see if we got these correct. Yes. Okay, moving on to number nine. We have z equal to x to the fourth minus 8x squared, y squared, plus y to the fourth. And here it's asking us for our four partial derivatives, okay? Observe that the second mixed partials are equal, okay? So I do not like to use this notation. I'm going to use a different notation. But this notation means z with x, with respect to x twice, okay? Um, and then this one, it's actually z with respect to x first, then y, because you apply your differentials on the left-hand side, right? You do this derivative on the left. So if you've already done a derivative, the one on the left is the second one that you're doing, okay? So it's actually with respect to x first and then with respect to y. Similarly, this is saying zyy and, oh, I'm putting z squared in the one. It's just saying second derivative and then with respect to which variable twice, this one twice. Um, but here it's going to be dx dy. So I'm taking the derivative with respect to y first, then with respect to x. Okay. So to do this, the first thing we're going to need to know is what's zx, the first derivatives. So we have to have the first partial derivatives. So with respect to x is going to be 4x cubed. Um, the a and the y squared will act as constant multipliers. Um, but this guy would do have to take the derivative of, so I will have to multiply by two. So I will get negative 16 y squared. And then when I take away one away from the exponent, I just get x. And the derivative of this with respect to x is just zero. Now for the partial derivative with respect to y, the derivative of this term would be zero. And then now all of this acts like a coefficient. But when I take the derivative, I have to multiply by two and then decrease the power by one. So I get negative 16 x squared, but then it becomes y to the power one. For the second term, the derivative with respect to y would be four y cubed. Now, to do the second derivative with respect to x. So now I'm doing this. Um, I've already done zx, and now I'm taking the other partial derivative of this, but with respect to x again. So this first term will become 12x squared. And then all of this will act like a constant multiplier, and the derivative of x is 1. So I really just get minus 16y squared. Now I've already done the derivative with respect to x. Now I'm gonna take that derivative and do it with respect to y. So there's no y's in the first term, so that would be zero. And here it's like negative 16 x will act like the multiplier, the constant multiplier, but the derivative of y squared will remind me to multiply by two, 
giving me negative 32x. And then the y will decrease by one power, which will just give me y. Now the derivative with respect to y, and then I'm taking the derivative with respect to y again. So now I'm looking at this one. And here, all of this acts like a coefficient, and the derivative of y is 1. So I just get negative 16x squared. The derivative of the next term with respect to y would be 12y squared. And then finally, I have the derivative with respect to y. I'm now going to take the derivative with respect to x. So in that case, the 16 and the y act like a constant multiplier. And then to take the derivative of x squared, you have to multiply it by 2 but then decrease the power of x by one. And then this doesn't have any x's in it, so the derivative of this is just zero. Now notice that this can also be written as negative 32xy. And so they do match, the two mixed partials do match. Now let's just type everything in here. Oh, I forgot to put my variable x. Nope, not in there. There we go. 12x squared minus 16y squared. Here we get negative 32xy. Here, negative 16x squared plus 12y squared. And then finally, for the last one, negative 32xy. Okay, let's check this one. All right. Now number 10. So we have f of xy equal to x squared plus 5xy plus y squared minus 29x minus 20y plus 12. Now this one says find all values of x and y such that the first partial with respect to x equals zero and the first partial with respect to y equals zero simultaneously, okay? So let's figure out what fx looks like. That would be 2x here. This would be like the constant. So it'd just be 5y. This is one big fat constant. So it'd be 0 minus 29, 0, and 0. Now the partial with respect to y. So this is a constant, which is 0. Here, this is like my constant multiplier. So we just get 5x. Here we get 2y. Um, here, this is like a constant. Here we get minus 20, and that's a constant, so we get zero. Now, fx equal to zero means that this will equal zero. And fy equal to zero means that this expression will equal zero. And so simultaneously, means that I'm essentially going to have to solve, um, I'm gonna move the 29 over, this equation, and at the same time, I'm gonna move the 20 over, solve this equation, okay? So it's like a system of equations. And in this system of equations, I'm going to use elimination method. So I'm going to do negative five times equation one, and I'm going to do 2 times equation 2. This will help me to eliminate the x variable so that when I multiply this by a negative 5, I'll get negative 10. And when I multiply this one by a positive 2, I'll get positive 10. And when I add the two equations together, the x's will eliminate, giving me the ability to solve for y. OK? So here I'm going to get negative um, 10x. And then 5 times negative 5 is negative 25y. And then 29 times negative 5 is negative 145. Now for the bottom, I'm going to multiply by positive 2. So I get positive 10x, 
positive 4y and positive 40. And when I add these two functions together, these are going to cancel. I'm going to end up with negative 21y equal to negative 105. And if I divide both sides by negative 21, I get 5, positive 5. Okay. I can take this solution for y and plug it into either equation to solve for x. I'm going to go ahead and plug it into the bottom equation because it has the smaller numbers. Um, it doesn't have 29, it just has 20. So we get 5x plus 10 equals 20. If I minus 10 over, I get 5x equal to 10. And if I divide by 5 on both sides, I get x equal to 2. So these are the solutions that will make both of these statements true at the same time. So if x is 2, this is 4. If y is 5, this is 25. And 4 plus 25 is, in fact, 29. And similarly here, if x is 2, this is 10. And if y is 5, this is also 10. And 10 plus 10 does equal 20. So those are our solutions. And if they wanted it a point, it has to be the x value first and then the y value. Okay, now we're going to move on to number 11. This is some more partial derivatives, just to make sure that you really understand um, the concept of partial derivatives. So to be sure that you're counting the correct variables as constants at the correct time, right? So if I want to find um, the total differential, this is how you find the total differential. dz will equal zx times dx plus zy times dy. So in this case, we will get zx, which is um, 4 and y are my constant multipliers. And I have to multiply it by 7 and then take one away, so I get x to the six. Now for the second term, it's actually a negative. Again, um, this is gonna act like my constant multiplier, but I'm gonna have to multiply by nine. So I get 63 y to the six, and then I decrease my power by one, and I get eight. And I'm gonna tag on this dx plus, now I'm gonna find zy. And so in here, this acts like the constant multiplier. The derivative of y is 1. So I just have 4x to the 7th. And here, this acts like the whole constant multiplier. But I got to multiply by 6 and then decrease the power by 1. So I get 42x to the 9th, but y to the 5th. And then tag on the dy. And the only thing you could possibly do is instead of writing y x to the sixth, you can write x to the sixth y. That's more formal, but to be honest, it doesn't matter. Okay, I think I got it all in there. Let's make sure. Didn't make an error. Yay, no, I didn't. Okay, good. Now we're going to move on to number 12. This one is going to require us to bring up that chain rule.
Okay, so before I plug in the numbers, um, they do just want the general derivatives. The first one they want is dw ds, which means I need to take dw dx and then dx ds plus dw dy and then dy um, ds. And so in this certain situation, we end up with, um, with respect to x, this would be zero. And then the negative five y would be the constant multiplier. So I'd get negative 10 y x. And then dx of ds, the derivative of this with respect to s is just e to the s. Now the derivative of w with respect to y, we get three y squared minus, this is like a big constant multiplier and the derivative of y is one. So I just get minus five x squared. Then the derivative of y with respect to s, there's no s's in here. So the derivative of that with respect to s would just be zero, which basically wipes out this whole second factor. And if I want to have this all in terms of S's and T's, this should be, um, this should be negative 10 and then Y is E to the T and X is E to the S. And I still have this E to the S right here. I just rewrote it, okay? Then if I clean that up, I'm basically having E to the t plus 2s. Because you do have to add all of your exponents together. Okay, now I am going to go ahead and evaluate the part at the bottom. So if I'm finding dw ds at the point um, negative 4 for s and 8 for t, then it's going to be negative t e to the 8 plus 2 times negative 4 which is eight plus negative eight, which is zero. So negative 10 times one, which is negative 10. So I have two answers here. I have this part, which is negative 10 E raised to the T plus two S. And then down here, when I plug in the S and the T they gave me, I get negative 10. Now let's go ahead and move on to the partial derivative with respect to T. So for this one, we're gonna do dw dt, and that's dw dx dx dt plus dw dy times dy dt. Now, the cool thing about the second one is we've already done these parts, right? It's the exact same thing that we had up there, okay? So we can use those expressions again. There's no sense in reinventing the same wheel, right? So I am gonna have negative 10 y x, just like I did before. But now I'm taking the derivative of x with respect to t. So if I take the derivative of x with respect to t, there's no t's here, so it's just zero. Then for the derivative of w with respect to y, we got three y squared minus five x squared. But if I do the derivative of y with respect to t, it's just e to the t. So that means this zero will get this whole term to go away, okay? And on the other one, if I want to simplify this, this is gonna be three e to the t squared, I don't need the bracket, I'm doing too much. I do need the bracket, but just not there. Okay, so I'm gonna put a bracket here and then I'm gonna have three e to the t squared because that's what x is, minus five, or I'm sorry, that's what y is. And then e to the s squared because that's what x is, and then of course I have this e to the t that's being multiplied on the outside. So I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna simplify this, but I'm also gonna distribute the e to the t. 
So when you have an exponent raised to the exponent, you actually multiply the exponents. And when I distribute that one in there, it's gonna have an e to the t multiplied. Same thing here, exponent raised to an exponent, I multiply those exponents. And then when I distribute that e to the t, I've got it in there now. So this can be written as 3e to the 3t, if I add these exponents together, minus 5e to the t plus 2s, if I add those two together. I could have also written it as 2s plus t. It doesn't matter, OK? But that is what I'm going to type in here. Oops, that was the answer for this part. I get 3e to the 3t minus 5e to the t plus 2s. So does that look like what's on my paper? It does. And so now I'm going to plug in the values they gave me for S and T. And so in that case, I'm gonna get three E to the three times um, eight for T and then negative four for S. So I get three E to the 24 minus five E to the zero which means three e to the 24 minus five. And I can't simplify that anymore and it does not tell me to round it, so I cannot round it. I'm just gonna have to type in this ugly number the way it is. And let's see if we got the correct answer. Okay, great. I apologize if I sound a little more monotone in this um, video. Um, I do have colleagues that I believe are currently recording as well. Um, I know that I have my noise cancellation turned on, so you might not be able to hear them in the video, but I can hear them and I'm sure they can hear me when I'm talking very loudly. So I know I'm not talking like super excitedly like I normally do, um, but I apologize. Okay, so. If the video is a little boring more than normal, because I know it can always be boring, um, it's math, right? It's not like we're talking about the cure for cancer, which is super exciting, or, you know, the greatest anime on streaming right now. We're not talking about anything fun. We're talking about math, right? So <laughs> with that in mind, I, I, it doesn't help when you're monotone and you're talking about math. So I am apologizing for that. but. You know why now, why um, I'm not being very loud or excited right now, okay? Not that I don't find this stuff exciting. This is my life and I love it. It's just I can't be very loud right now. Um, so number 13 wants us to differentiate implicitly. Okay, whenever it wants us to differentiate in, in implicitly, the first thing we need to do is define a function. And normally they use a capital F to describe this function, okay? So we say the F of X, Y, and Z be this thing as if it were equal to zero. So if I were to minus the 81, I would have this function, okay? And then from there, you can find all of the partial derivatives. So for this one, it would be 10x. For fy, it would be 14y. And then for fz, it would be 22z. Then if I wanna find dz, dx, essentially what I'm doing is I'm doing the negative of fx over fz. And so in this case, that's negative 10x over 22z, which can reduce a little bit, but not too much. We just get this is our final answer there. Then if I wanna find dz dy, we're gonna do the negative of fx 
I'm sorry, Fy over Fz. So I get the negative and Fy is 14y and Fz is still 22z. So if I reduce that, I get negative 7y over 11z. So let me plug these in here. We have negative 5x over 11z. And then down here, we have um, negative, or, nope, negative 7y over 11z. Now this is just a faster approach than to take this and then solve for z so that the function looks like z equal to something and most likely it's gonna have a house, right? Um, and then trying to take the derivative of that function. With the house in there, the derivative of the square root is gonna be pretty intense. So having this method, it really does help the implicit differentiation. Um, but let's not forget to check our answers. Okay, we got both two checks. Now, I if you saw that, but that's what I should be doing right now, but I'm working on this video, so when I'm done, I'll go do my smart advising. Um, okay, now they give us the point five, six, negative five, and they even give us a vector, but I'm gonna put it in component form. So 10 for i, one for j, and negative one for k. And I want the directional derivative. Um, I don't know if you remember what the directional derivative looks like, but it looks like this, and it's the gradient of f evaluated at a certain point times a unit vector in a certain direction, okay? And um, it's the dot product, actually. So you will get a scalar value, meaning just a one number. I don't know what that number is gonna be yet because we haven't done the mechanics of this problem, okay? But if we start, the first thing I like to do is over here on the side is figure out what my unit vector is. Um, if I look at the magnitude of V, if the magnitude is one, then this is a unit vector and I don't need to use a different vector. But I don't think that the magnitude is going to be one. The magnitude is 102. So if I want a unit vector, I'm going to basically have to take 10 over the square root of 102, one over the square root of 102, and then negative one over the square root of 102. And this will be the unit vector that I use there, okay? But something else I also need before I use this formula is the gradient of f, okay? And so the derivative with respect to x. So here I get um, y, zero and z. For the derivative with respect to y, I get x plus z plus zero. And the derivative with respect to z, I get zero y plus x. And so if I plug in the point that they gave me, I have y plus z, so six plus negative five, which is one. Here I have x plus z, so five plus negative five, which is zero. And here I have y plus x, which is six plus five, which is 11. So then if I wanna find du of f, it's going to be this vector dot product with my unit vector. And so then that dot product becomes 10 over the square root of 102 plus zero times anything is zero plus negative 11 over the square root of 102, 
which is negative one over the square root of one and two. Now that might be able to simplify, but I don't know that it's necessary that I simplify it. I'm just gonna plug it in and see if it likes it. Yeah, it does. Okay, great. Then I didn't need to rationalize it or simplify the radical or anything like that. It just took it, so good. Now, let's keep going on to 15. So it says f of x, y is x squared plus 2xy, and my point is 2, 1. And they just want me to find the gradient evaluated at that. This problem should be before number 14. Because didn't I do that? Didn't I find the gradient and then plug in a number? We've already done this problem. Um, it's actually, it was a part of this other problem. So I don't know why it's here down at the bottom, but whatever. It is what it is. So the gradient of f, just the general gradient, is going to be 2x plus 2y. And then the derivative with respect to y is 0 and 2x. So of course, the gradient of f with this numbers plugged in is going to be 2 times 2 plus 2 times 1 comma 2 times 2. So we get 4 plus 2, which is 6, and then just 4. So in here we get, um, oh, I see what, we, what we're doing different. Um, oh, I noticed that I can't use those symbols. I have to use the vector symbol. So 6 comma 4. Now, So now this other part though, we haven't done yet. And it says find the maximum value of the directional derivative, okay? If you want the max value of du of f, right? Then that means you basically need to find the magnitude of the gradient of f evaluated at your point. Okay, so in essentially what that means is I need to find the magnitude of 6, 4, which is the square root of 36 plus 16, which is just the square root of 52. Now you can simplify the square root of 52 if you wanted to try, but I'm not. I'm just going to type in square root of 52. I think it's 2 square root of 13 or something like that, but but it accepts square root of 52. So why make it more complicated, right? Okay, now let's work on number 16. I think there are 20 problems, so we're making our way. You know, they take some time, but, and there's not many definitions that I have to pull up to remember. So chances are that the notes for this test, they're not going to be as lengthy. I am curious, though. Let me pause real quick because I'm going to go see what that note sheet looks like if there's one in there already. OK, so I did go look it up just because I was curious. I know it's all random in the middle of the recording, but I was curious if I did have a um, note sheet in there and I do and it has everything it has covers the notation it covers the notation for the multiple partial derivatives um, it comes with the notation for the total differentials it talks about the chain rules it talks about the implicit differentiation it talks about the gradient and has the definition of a directional derivative um, personally, I used the alternative form of the directional derivative. Um, it gives you some properties and rules about the directional derivative. It describes the definition of a critical point, which is what we had done in a previous problem. Um, it talks about the equation of a tangent line, it talks about the second partials test on finding maximum, minimums, or saddle points. Um, and it even talks about the method of Lagrange multipliers. So, it really does, oops, 
it really does hit um, everything. Now I'm gonna have to change purple one because I just saw it. And anyone can push pause <laughs> and just write that question down. So I'm gonna change question one. Um, excuse me, but you do have um, a pretty big note sheet with everything significant that you would need from chapter um, 13, okay? So let me get back to our review so we can finish this. Now, um, bum, bum, bum. okay, so number 16 asks us to find the equation of the tangent plane. So in order for us to do that, we do have to find the normal um, vector. And the normal vector is pretty much the gradient vector evaluated at that point. So we're going to find the normal vector, which is gonna be the gradient, and I'm gonna use a capital F, um, evaluated at this point, okay? But one, I don't have a capital F because I haven't defined it yet. So I'm gonna say let capital F of X, Y, and Z be X, Y squared, plus 5x minus z squared minus 11, okay? And now I have defined my capital F, and so I can start trying to find its gradient and then trying to plug in this number, okay? So this means my gradient for capital F is going to be the derivative with respect to x is y squared plus 5. The derivative with respect to y is 2xy. And the derivative with respect to z is negative 2z. Now, if I want to plug in um, this point, I'm going to get, if I plug in the point, I'm going to have negative 2 for y, 4 for x, negative 2 for y, and then 5 for z. So my normal vector is going to be four plus five, which is nine. Um, eight times that is negative 16 and then negative 10. And so what is the equation gonna look like? That's gonna be a times x minus the x coordinate um, plus b, which is a negative y minus the y coordinate plus negative 10 z minus the z coordinate equal to zero. Now, normally they don't like us to write that in there, but it might just accept that. Um, but normally what they want is they want us to distribute the nine, distribute the 16, distribute the 10. And so we get 9x minus 16y minus 10z minus 18 equal to 0, or 9x minus 16y minus 10z equal to 18. So let's plug that in there. 9x minus 16y minus 10z equal to 18. And let's see if that is correct. Okay, yes it is. And so number 17 is not much different. The process is exactly the same. The only thing different with number 17 is that it also asks you for the symmetrical equations, okay? So I'm gonna repeat everything the same like I did for number 16. I'm just gonna have one extra part at the end, okay? So since this is my function, and this is my point, I'm going to say let capital F of x, y, and z equal x plus y plus z minus 11. Then my gradient of F Oops. is going to be one, one, and one. So my normal vector then, which would be the gradient of F evaluated at your point, 
Well, there's nowhere to plug in four for X, four for Y, or three for Z. So the normal vector is just one, one, one. Okay. So then my equation is going to be A times X minus the X coordinate plus B, Y minus the Y coordinate plus C, and then Z minus um, the Z coordinate equal to zero. So if I distribute, I get X minus four plus Y minus four plus Z minus three. Sorry, my pencil ran out of ink. And so then if I combine that, I get negative um, 11. And if I move the 11 over, it coincidentally turns out to be the exact same plane, okay? Okay. Now for the symmetrical equations, those are going to be x minus your x coordinate equal to a times t, y minus the y coordinate equal to b times t, and z minus the z coordinate equal to c times t. Well, these are all equal to t, which tells us that they are all equal to each other. And so that is, I believe, this option here. So let's check it and make sure that it is good. Okay, so now we're moving on to 18. We're getting down to the last three in this section. I've been doing great so far. Uh, Okay, this one says identify any extrema of the function by recognizing its given form or its form after completing the square. Verify your results by using partial derivatives to locate any critical points and test for relative extrema. Okay. Yes, it says verify your results by using the partial derivatives. Okay, gotcha. So Personally, looking at this, you can identify what um, is going on here. So I'm going to talk it out, and then we're going to go do the calculus to verify, okay? So we know that no matter what x and y are, when we square them, they will be positive, right? So no matter what I do, when I square an x value and I square a y value, it will be a positive number. And then I'm going to add nine to this positive number, okay? So what is the absolute highest that it could be? Well, if X is a really, really large number or a really, really, really far into the negative number, right? Like 1,000 or negative 1,000, right? When I square it, it's gonna be a huge number and the same for Y. So as big as these get, this sum will be even bigger. And then when I add nine to it, it gets even bigger, okay? So this has no maximum. Because I could keep plugging in more and more and more bigger values for X and Y, and I will still keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger values when I take the square root of it, okay? However, the smallest that X and Y could be when I square them is zero, okay? So when I square a positive number or zero, um, it can't get any smaller than zero. So if X and Y were both equal to zero, they would, this sum would be the smallest it's ever gonna be, which is zero. And then if I add nine, well now I'm talking about the square root of nine, which is three. So what that tells me is that when X is zero, Y is zero, and I plug those in, I get three. This is a minimum, okay? And so I already know just from analyzing this, that this one will be D and E, and this one will be zero comma zero comma three. However, the directions did tell me 
to make sure that I actually verify this using my partial derivatives and my critical points, okay? So even though I can analyze it in my mind and use logic to figure it out, we do want to see the calculus, okay? Um, so if I go ahead and I take the first partial derivative, and this is not gonna be pretty, but it is what it is, okay? Um, I'm gonna write that house as a one half power, and I'm gonna bring down that power. And then I'm gonna decrease that power by one, and then I'm gonna apply the chain rule and take the derivative of this with respect to x is two x, okay? And if I clean this up, the two and the two will cancel, and I'll have positive one x in my numerator and the square root of all this business in the denominator, okay? Then now if I do fy, again, I'm gonna bring down the house, keep what's in the house the same, decrease the power by one, but now I gotta multiply by the inside with respect to y, and so I get two y, Again, these are going to cancel. And so I'm going to get y over the square root of x squared plus y squared plus nine. Now, if I take fx equal to zero, this means to take this fraction equal to zero. And if I multiply both sides of this fraction by that square root, it's going to cancel here but it's going to give me x by itself on the left-hand side. And here, zero times anything is still zero. Now, if I set fy equal to zero, the same sort of thing is going to happen. I need to get rid of that um, fraction, so I'm gonna multiply both sides by the square root of all of that x squared plus y squared plus nine. So it will cancel here, giving me y, but zero times anything is still zero, okay? And so now my critical point is going to be zero comma zero comma f of zero, zero. So what the heck is f zero, zero? That's zero squared plus zero squared plus nine, which is three. So that means my critical point is zero, zero, three. And that's the exact same point that we had up there, okay? But I have verified that it's happening in the correct location. What I haven't verified is whether it's actually a minimum or a maximum, okay? And in order for me to do that, I like to do the second derivative test, okay? So I'm gonna find those partial, second partial derivatives. Now, again, it's not easy, but I do need to do it. And I'm gonna use this version when I have to find these second derivatives. Okay, so I'm gonna use this version too. So when I find fxx, I'm taking the derivative of fx with respect to x again. So I have something with x in the front and something with x next to it. So I'm gonna have to use my product rule. So I'm gonna take the first function times the derivative of the second. So I will bring down my power, keep my base the same, and then decrease the power by one, so now it will be negative three halves. And then of course I have to apply the chain rule and multiply it by the derivative of the inside with respect to x. I get two x. Plus, now I'm gonna write the second function and multiply the derivative of the first function. Derivative of x is just one. So if I try to clean this up, you have to bear with me because I'm gonna do it really quickly. I'm gonna get x times negative one times x, which is negative x squared. And here I'm just gonna get x squared plus y squared plus nine to the negative one half. Now, if I factor out the common factor, I do have to factor out the one with the smaller exponent. So I will just get negative x squared in the front. But here, when I factor out the smallest exponent, I get negative one half 
minus negative three halves, which means I get this stuff raised to the one exponent, okay? So I factored out the common factor, but I had to go with the lowest exponent. And when I factored that out, I ended up with the x squared here. But when I factored it out from there, I had to take this exponent minus that exponent, which gave me the new exponent of one. Which makes sense because when I multiply this back in here, you add the exponents and you do get negative one half. Now, if I simplify in there, Okay, this x squared and this x squared will cancel, and I'll just have y squared plus 9. Now we're going to go one extra little bit, and we're going to say, what is fx evaluated at our critical point? Okay, fxx evaluated at our critical point is going to be um, 0 squared plus 0 squared plus 9 to the negative 3 halves times zero squared plus nine. So what does that mean? That means um, nine to the negative three halves times nine. Let's see what that is. Um, nine raised to the three halves. Oh, negative three halves, that's important. Negative three halves times nine, just regular nine we get one third. Okay. Now, let's do the same thing for f double y. So now we're gonna take the derivative with respect to y of the first derivative with respect to y. That's this guy, okay? So I'm gonna try to keep these both in my window while I do the product rule, because you have something with y here and something with y there, okay? So when I do that, I'm going to have the first function times the derivative of the second function. And then the chain rule with respect to y would be 2y. And then the second function times the derivative of the first function with respect to y is just one. And again, this two and this two are gonna cancel, but I'm gonna end up with negative y squared and here times one, I'm just gonna have this. And if I factor out the common factor with the smaller exponent, that's the negative three halves. I'm going to get negative y squared plus x squared plus y squared plus nine all raised to the power of one. Well, then that means the y squared and the y squared are going to cancel. So I get x squared plus y squared plus nine to the negative three halves times x squared plus nine. And if I want to figure out what f, y, y is at my critical point, I'm going to get 0, 0, 9 to the negative 3 halves, 0 squared plus 9. We have already done this calculation, and we did get 1 third the last time. Okay. Now, here's the more complicated one, the f, x, y. So I'm going to take this, but I'm going to take the derivative of it with respect to y. So notice that there is nothing with y out in the front. So I do not need to use the product rule. I just need to use the constant multiplier and take the derivative of this with respect to y. So I'm going to do x as my constant multiplier and then the derivative of that expression. So bring down my power. Um, keep the base the same, decrease the power by one, so I get negative three halves, um, and then the chain rule multiplied by the derivative with respect to y, I get two y. So then what happens is that this and this cancel, 
but I have x times negative one times y. So that's negative xy and then x squared plus y squared plus nine to the negative three halves. And if I wanna find f of x, y at my critical point, I'm going to get negative zero times zero times zero squared plus zero squared plus nine to the negative three halves. Zero times anything is all just zero. So now we can find our discriminant there. So D equals FXX, which was one third, times FYY, which was one third, minus FXY, which was zero squared. This gives me one ninth, okay? This is greater than zero, which means it's not a saddle point. It's either a max or a min, okay? Now, because fx is one third and that is greater than zero, both of these bits of information tell me that I am talking about a minimum, okay? And so you already established where that minimum is gonna happen it's gonna happen at your critical point, right? But now you've also ex expressed what is happening at that critical point, and it is in fact a minimum according to the second derivative test. The second partial derivatives test. Okay, now similarly, we're gonna do the same kind of thing, but this function isn't as complicated because it doesn't have a house, right? So number 19 should go a little bit smoother and quicker than 18 did. So number 19, um, we have this function. Oops, it says minus x squared. So it does not tell me to try to identify it just by recognizing anything. It just tells me to examine the function for relative extrema. So I'm essentially gonna do the second part of what I did for number 18. Not the part where I was analyzing and using logic, but the part where I was working out the mechanics of the calculus, okay? So the first thing we have to do is figure out where the critical number is. And that's gonna happen when hx equals zero and when hy equals zero. So the first thing I need to do is find hx and hy. So for hx, I get 100 minus two x. And for hy, I get um, 100 minus two y. And so if I wanna find the critical points, I'm going to solve this system of equations. And since each equation only has one variable in it, it is pretty easy to solve for x. x is going to be 50, and it just so happens that y is also going to be 50. And all I did was add the 2x over and divide both sides by 2. Add the 2y over and divide both sides by 2, OK? Now that I know where my critical point is, let's figure out where h of 50, 50 is. So that would be 100 times 50 plus 100 times 50 minus 50 squared minus 50 squared. I'm running out of room in there. So I tried squishing it all in there, but let's go plug it in. 100 times 50 plus 100 times 50 minus 50 squared minus 50 squared, and I get 5,000. So my critical point is going to be 50, 50, and 5,000, okay? Now, um, the issue here is going to be that I need to figure out whether or not it's a maximum or minimum or saddle point, okay? So let's go ahead and find our second derivatives. So the derivative of hx with respect to x is negative two, hyy. The derivative of hy with respect to y, and then xy. The derivative of hx, but with respect to y. No y's, no y's, so that derivative is zero. So then I'm gonna find my determinant. I get negative two times negative two minus zero squared, which is four. 
that is greater than zero, which tells me that I'm either gonna have a maximum or a minimum. So just knowing that, I already know that this part does not exist, okay? But I also have to compare each x, x, which is negative two. That's less than zero, which means that there's actually a maximum at this critical number, 50, 50, 5,000. So min is also going to be D and E, and max is going to be 50, 50, 5, Okay, now I'm on the very, oh no, there's way more than 20, there's 23. Oh, I thought I was on the last one, but no, we're not. <laughs> okay, fine. Let's keep going. So let's go ahead and do the relative. Um, same thing, it's all the same thing. I guess just practice with different functions. So I'm gonna do GX, which is 2X minus five, GY, which is negative 2Y minus four. And so then if I set each of those equal to zero, to find my critical numbers, I get that x equals 2.5, and I get that y equals negative 2. And so then what is g of 2.5 and negative 2? And I don't know that, so let's see. Um, 2.5 squared minus um, negative 2 squared minus 5 times 2.5 minus 4 times negative 2. I get negative 2.25. So this means my critical point is at 2.5, negative 2, negative 2.25. So if I wanna know if that's a max or a min or a saddle point, I do need to go ahead and um, find those second partials. So G of X, X is gonna be two. G of Y, Y is gonna be negative two. And G of X, Y is going to be zero. So then in this case, your discriminant is gonna be two, negative two minus zero squared, which is negative four. That's less than zero. I don't even need to check GXX when it's less than zero. This automatically means there's a saddle point. I'm trying to squish the coordinates in there, but you get the idea. So that means no max and no min. But here it's going to be 2.5 comma negative 2 comma negative 2.25. And let's check it. Okay, so far so good. Now with 21, I definitely need to pay. So for 21, They tell us to find the minimum distance from the point that they gave me to this surface. And it even says simplify, to simplify the computations, minimize the square of the distance, okay? So first thing I'm gonna do is write down my Z. And then I've got this point here, negative two, negative two, zero. So what this means is we're gonna have to actually figure out the distance. Now the distance is the square root of x minus this x coordinate, y minus this y coordinate, 
and then Z minus, well, instead of Z, we're gonna put what Z is equivalent to in terms of X and Y, but you get two minus two X minus two Y minus the Z coordinate squares. Now, it does say, in order for me to simplify it, I can just minimize the square of the distance. So we're gonna say distance squared. And so if I square this side, I get this. If I square this side, this big house is no longer there. So I just have X plus two squared, Y plus two squared. And then here, this is really like it's not there. And when you square a house, the house just goes away. Okay, and so then this is what I'm going to maximize. So we're gonna call this S. And in order for us to find the critical points of S, we do have to do those partial derivatives. So SX would be two X plus two to the power one, and the derivative with respect to X is just one. Um, and then over here, this has no X's, so it'd be zero, zero, minus two, and zero. So we get 2x plus 4 minus 2, which is 2x plus 2. Then for sy, this is 0. This is 2 plus y plus 2 squared times the chain rule 1, 0, 0, and minus 2. So we get 2y plus 4 minus 2, which is 2y plus 2. Now remember, Sx equal to zero means this equals zero. Sy equals to zero means this equals zero. So this tells me x equals negative one, and this one tells me y equals negative one. And if I wanna know what z equals, I need to plug in these values into z. So two minus two times negative one minus two times negative one we get the square root of two plus two plus two, which is six. Okay, so now I know what the square root of, or what Z looks like. So this tells me I have a critical number or critical point at negative one, negative one, and square root of six, okay? Now, I just don't know, I'm guessing it's a minimum because they told me it was a minimum, um, but we can verify, right? So if we find SXX, it would just be two. SYY would be two. And SXY would be zero. So D would equal two times two minus zero squared, which is four, that's greater than zero. And then SXX was two, which is greater than zero, which means it's a minimum. Okay, so we did verify that it is a minimum happening at this critical point, but what it wants us to know is the minimum distance. So then that means we need to go back to that formula for distance and we need to plug in the values that we found. So for distance, we got the square root of X, which is negative one minus a negative two is plus two plus y is negative one minus a negative two is the same as plus two. And then z, which I found is the square root of six minus the zero squared. So we get uh, one squared, which is one, one squared, which is one, the square root is six squared, which is six. So you get the square root of eight. And that can be simplified into two square root of two. So we're gonna type two square root of two. And then we're finally on our last two problems which have to do with the Grange multiplier. So those are nice. Um, so I think I could fit number 22 here. So we're trying to maximize this function And our constraint is this function. So I'm gonna say let g of x, y be six y minus three x squared, where the constant that it's equal to is zero, 
Okay. Then if I find the gradient of f, that's going to be 12x and 0, and then 0 and negative 8y. And according to the Lagrange multipliers, I get systems of equations by setting the gradient of f um, equal to the lambda of the gradient of g. So we definitely need to find the gradient of g as well. So the derivative with respect to x is negative 6x. The derivative with respect to y is just 6. And so I create this system of equations. One is that 12x, this component, must equal lambda times that component. Similarly, this component, negative 8y, should equal lambda times this component. And then the last um, equation is going to be your constraint. So 6y minus 3x squared equal to 0. And this is the system that you need to solve, OK? Mostly for xy, but if you happen to figure out what lambda is as well, that's totally OK. So for me, I'm going to take this first top equation, and I'm going to say 12x, and I'm going to move over this term, plus 6x lambda. And then if I factor out the 6x, I get um, 2 plus lambda in the parentheses. And so I get that 6x equals 0 or lambda, 2 plus lambda equals 0. So either x equals 0 or lambda equals negative 2. Okay. Now, it does say that x and y must be positive. It does not say that they could be zero. If zero is okay, it would have said non-negative because then non-negative means positive or zero. But because it specifically said positive, I know that x is not equal to zero because zero is not positive, okay? So that does mean that then lambda needs to equal negative two. Well, that's fine because if lambda equals negative two, then I know that this is eight y equal to six times negative two which is negative 8y equal to negative 12. And if I solve for that y, I get 12 divided by 8, which is 1.5, OK? And then if I verify that this is actually true, let's see, 6 times 1.5 minus 3 times, um, I don't know what x is, so I'm just going to leave it as x. Let's see, 6 times 1.5 is 9. And so if I um, keep solving this, I'm going to say 9 equals 3x squared. 3 equals x squared if I divide both by 3. And I get x equals plus or minus the square root of 3. Now, we already know that x cannot be negative. So we know that x must equal the positive square root of three, okay? So we have found the x and the y already, but we do still need to find f of this x value and this y value. And so that would be six times the square root of three squared minus four times 1.5 squared. So let's see what that is. Six parentheses square root of three squared minus 4 times 1.5 squared, I get 9. So in here, I'm going to type the square root of 3, comma, 1.5. And over here, I'm going to type in 9. And let's see if that is correct. Yeah, we got double checks. OK, so last problem. Um, it's still a Lagrange multiplier, except this one has three variables. So it just makes the system a little bit longer, but the process is still exactly the same. So if I move the nine over, I can say let g of x, y, and z 
equal x plus y plus z, where the constant is equal to nine, right? And then I can even find the gradient of g, it would just be one, one, and one. Now the gradient of f though, is equal to yz, xz, and xy. And so we know that the gradient of f has this multiplier, Lagrange multiplier, so that they have this relationship. So what that means is that this, com this um, component should equal lambda times one, which is just lambda. The middle component should equal lambda times one, which is just lambda. The third component should equal lambda times one, which is just lambda. And the last thing in here is your constraint. Okay. And so we need to solve um, this system of equations. Now, this one is a little bit more complicated to solve, um, but I'm going to try my best to, to, to work it out. So I like to take equations one and two together, and that tells me that yz should equal xz, or that yz minus xz should equal zero, or that z times y minus x should equal zero. So this tells me z should equal zero, or y minus x should equal zero, which means y should equal x. Now it does tell me that x, y, and z are positive specifically. So I know that z cannot equal zero because zero is not positive. So that tells me that I must have this relationship y equal to x, okay? So if y equals to x, then that means that this expression becomes x times x equal to lambda or that um, lambda equals x squared, okay? Now, that's not really going to help me solve anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, maybe that knowing this information isn't going to help us get anywhere, but Let's go ahead and plug all of these things in. So if I solve for, let's get it all in terms of Z. So if I take this one and I solve for Z, I'm going to get, or I'm sorry, if I solve for Y, I'm going to get Lambda over Z for Y. Then here, if I solve for Z over here, I'm gonna get Lambda or solve for x, I'm going to get lambda over z equals x. OK. So then I have this expression. And if I multiply everybody by z, it will become lambda plus lambda plus z squared minus 9 equal to 0, or z squared equals 9 minus 2 lambda. Hmm, this is not helping me, though. trying to see how I'm going to get a value for x, y, and z. <laughs> so I think I'm going to erase this. This did not get me anywhere. Let's see, if x is x and y is also x, I can get that z will equal, when I move the 9 over, it'll be 9. And when I have this 2x and I move that over, it'll be minus 2x. OK, that's fine. Then if I take 
Maybe we'll take another relationship. Instead of taking the top two, let's take the bottom two together. So if the bottom two are, equ are both equivalent to lambda, then the bottom two should be equivalent to each other, okay? Now we do have an expression for z in terms of x, and we do have an expression for y in terms of x. And so this becomes 9x minus 2x squared equal to x squared. If I minus this over, I get 9x minus 3x squared equal to zero. If I factor out a 3x, I get 3 minus x equal to zero. So I get this equals zero or this equals zero. And if I divide by three, I get x equals zero. And if I add x, I get x equals three. So we already know that x should be positive. So it's definitely not equal to zero. And we also know this relationship over here in red that I circled, that y is equal to x. So if x is equal to three, then according to that up there, y is also equal to three. And then according to this up here, if I know x, z should equal nine minus two times that x. So z should equal nine minus six, or z should also equal three. So now if I wanna find this um, extrema here, we're going to use um, three for x, three for y, and three for z. And since the function was just to multiply them all together, we're just gonna be doing three times three times three, which is 27. And so what do we get? We got three comma three comma three. And over here, we got 27. Now let's make sure that that's actually correct, right? Yes, we got both of our checks, so good. Um, so we didn't really have to do this right here. or this, we just had to take the top two equations and set those equal to each other. And then we took the bottom or the two middle ones. We took these two together and came up with this, okay? And we also plugged in this into here to come up with this, okay? Um, And then we use this for z and then this thing for y. So there's a lot of playing around with those equations, but we just had to keep working with them until we could solve for all of our variables, okay? But that is finally the end of the review. So hopefully these will help guide you as you work on these problems for the review assignment in WebAssign. But then I also hope that they give you some guidance on um, what you need to study and how to work out the problems that could possibly be on the test. Because I am just like the first review, I do get the problems from this review. I just change the numbers of them. Sometimes the functions change a little bit too, but the process does not change. Um, so if you know how to take partial derivatives, you should be completely fine on this test.